pull in the participants or down over here so you can kind of see what sent me with that and then click this on top of it. <clears throat> okay, there's 19 attendees who are coming in. Why aren't we seeing them? Oh, they're pouring. It's yes, kind of they get on it. very fast, Joy. One of the things we notice is that uh, it tends to be that our folks tend to be very, very much on time. Um, and, uh, and Dan Tillis, I see that you're there. Uh, terrific. Actually, Joy, they're friends of ours who live down in Boise. And so we typically would see them in normal times here. Uh, Patricia Murray Childers and Wayne, I see you're there. Uh, Jessica, I see you're in. Uh, Richard and Cindy Wilson, I see you just came up. And my good friend Palmer Clarkson from Jacksonville, Florida. Palmer, it's past your bedtime. What are you doing up? Still waiting here for us. So uh, good to have you here. Michelle and Michael Marks, Dan Merrill. Um, oh, my wife Blakesley is on too. It's great that she's watching this. This is pretty cool. Um, so. Joy, I know there's a few of your friends in there. And uh, uh, by the way, we can talk over each other as we normally would do in normal life. It's just like, just like us being at a dinner table. So. Uh, well, I see, I see June Jacobs is there. Thank you so much, June. And now has Joy signed on yet? I don't mean me. I mean, Joy Wachowski. I don't. Well, you, we are pulling that up right now to see. Yes, she's there. Yay. You can't have too many Joys. So thank you. This is so great. The more joy, the better. Um, and Michael, Michael Fox, are you on yet? Michael Pierce. Well, we've got, so I would say that they're on, probably on um, and um, they're, they're, so on, they're coming. Fun. And so it's, it's kind of cool. So typically, Joy, the way this really works is the first and most important thing for all of our guests is to drink. open that bottle of <laughs> Joy's sparkling uh, and, and and get it in a glass. Um, I have I have one and Joy has one. It has her name on the front of it. Her glass says she's a little more upscale than I am. And um, uh, my partner of crime is running the computer right next to me. Blakesley has a glass too. So uh, I want to toast to everybody. I don't know if you could hear that, but um, uh, toast everybody to uh, enjoying a glass of Joy's sparkling as we get going. And then we will come a little bit later. We can talk about the wines uh, that we've brought for you. Uh, and this should be an awful lot of fun. So as people are getting on, I just want to uh, introduce everybody to my dear, dear friend, Joy Sterling, who is my co-host today. And this makes it really fun for me to have other people here um, uh, that I can have as co-host, especially when they're really dear, dear friends who have been such a pivotal part of our whole uh, lives and been in and out of our lives so many times. And uh, Joy, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. I am so delighted to be with you. And I just am seeing in the chat that some people on the East Coast, they're already beyond bubbles and they're into red wines and that's absolutely fine since Chapelet Reds are just so gorgeous. Um, I, however, want to uh, confess that I am lovingly known in my family as a bubble head and I'm just fine with that. And I believe that bubbles are before, during and after. They're good for all times. Well, I, I hate to admit this, but actually Joy and I have noticed each other for over 35 years. And um, what's interesting is there is some similarities to how Joy and I ended up with our jobs. And so I'm gonna let Joy talk a little bit about um, how we met and, and how we both ended up doing kind of what we do. And most of you know the story of who I am and what, what I do. But for those of you who don't, um, Joy can tell you about a little bit about that too. But I, I think it's important for people to know kind of who we are and where we came from and, and our background a little bit, Joy. So I'm going to put it on to you right there. Well, my pleasure. First of all, uh, one of the great privileges of being a sparkling wine producer is that I typically have the pleasure of offering the first toast. So I want to propose a toast to Cyril and to Blakesley and to all of you who are uh, tasting with us uh, today, it is really 
a pleasure to be with you. So first things first, cheers. Cheers. And, and which of your sparkling are you starting with, Joy? There's a couple of people out there asking. So I, uh, we're pouring two uh, bubbles today, and I am starting with the 2016 Ocean Reserve, which is a Blanc de Blanc, 100% Chardonnay, and it is a partnership with National Geographic. And I'm very proud. Um, this is Vintage 2016, our first year working with National Geographic was Vintage 2005. And we give $4 a bottle to Nat Geo's Ocean Initiative. Um, you'll see behind me our view. This was taken just the other day. And I love it because it, it looks like I'm in a snow globe um, or the perfect bubble is another way of looking at it. But what would be in front of me would be in 13 miles as the drone flies, the ocean. And the Pacific is the engine of our microclimate. It brings in the fog through the, uh, the gap in the coastal range to the south of us, the Petaluma Gap. And then it comes into our special growing area, which is Green Valley. And we're the coolest, foggiest part of the Russian River. And the ocean is so important to us. It's the driver, as I say, of that fog. It's what allows us to make sparkling wine on this level of finesse and elegance. So taking care of the ocean, the health of the ocean is critical to what we do and why we make um, ocean reserve. So uh, Cyril and I are um, the beneficiaries of multi-generational friendship. Our parents were friends in Los Angeles uh, 3 million years ago and um, the Chapelais came up to Northern California. Cyril, am I right? It was the 60s? Yes, uh, late 60s. Actually, 1967 was when we bought Pritchard Hill. So my parents uh, were um, a little delinquent. They came in uh, 1976. So next uh, year, in a few weeks, um, will be our 45th vintage here at Iron Horse. And um, so, there are no two points on the wine map further apart in Northern California than Chapelet and Iron Horse because we are so far west. And um, so totally, totally different um, growing conditions, but in terms of our lives, exactly parallel. Both are family businesses. Here at Iron Horse, we have three generations living here from, well, now six months old to 89. And uh, actually that's four generations. I have got to learn to change my story here. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and, we, and we have this unbelievable sort of Walton-like, wonderful 19th century style life. We all live on the property. So Iron Horse is not only our business, but it's also our home. And we are completely a state bottle. We only use our own grapes. We have 164 acres in vine. A lot of the property is floodplain. And uh, sometimes, uh, well, we're hoping actually soon we'll become Island Iron Horse. We're trying to do all of our rain dances to get, get some rain. Uh, we did have a little bit, which is why we have this first uh, rainbow of the winter. Um, but um, you get to decide whether you wanna be flooded in or flooded out and both have their advantages. Flooded in, um, plenty of wine. Uh, flooded out, uh, electricity. So you really have to just choose what your, <laughs> what your priorities are. <laughs> I know generally I go for the wine, but <laughs> um, and um, I think the other, uh, the other things that bind us as great friends forever, Cyril and Blakesley, I'm sorry, you're stuck with me forever, um, <laughs> is number one, our, our love of life and um, well, our ability to love and also our love of the land. And those are all critical elements. And as we've all talked about, and anybody who 
is watching us here and is, is with us all knows how important the terroir is and our land is. And it really is location, location. And for what Joy does, she is in a remarkable location. She needs that cool weather. She needs that, uh, that, that influence that she gets from, from the ocean to make it all happen. And we need the heat on Pritchard Hill. So it's perfect for the doing the different things. And they're very different, no question about it. It's, it's you know, we actually get grapes from one of Joy's neighbors uh, for our Pinot Noir and one of our Chardonnays. And the Duttons are uh, dear friends uh, of Joy's and they live around you know, kind of around the corner. They're, they were apple farmers originally and now they're growing some beautiful grapes. And we actually get some grapes out of the Petaluma Gap that Al Renneria is overseeing too. So we are able to dip our toe over the county line from time to time to, to visit and, uh, and to see it once we get our passport stamped. Um, but, um, but Joy has been such a big part of our lives. And I wanna just refresh back to 18 years ago when um, I heard from the people who were running the castle where Blakesley and I were getting married that all of this wine and all these cases showed up in Switzerland and they said, well, what do we do with that? And I said, found out what it was and realized that Joy had actually had very special bottles. Let me get this up the right side, uh, <laughs> made uh, for us. And this is a Russian cuvee. And Joy knew that Blakesley and I were really keen on the Russian cuvee. And I'm gonna let Joy talk a little bit about the Russian cuvee and what an important part of her history the Russian cuvee is. Um, but uh, she made a spe special bottles for us. Um, and then there's, uh, and then these are some of the little wedding bottles that we have. And we've kept a few of these all these years, Joy. And I tell you what, every once in a while you open one and they are stunning. They are absolutely delightful. They haven't lost anything at all. They, they, they're they so, of course, they've been in, they they're just, Most people don't think of bubbles as actually gaining. And yep. you know, with sparkling wine, you have two kinds of aging, just like you do with um, your wines, there's barrel aging and bottle aging. Well, for bubbles, it's always been in the bottle. We, you know, that's where the, the wine making happens. The secondary fermentation takes place in the bottle. And then you're aging it in the bottle on the yeast in the bottle or entourage. But then you have aging on the cork. And that is a form of oxidation because as, as time goes by, the mushroom stem of that cork gets smaller, allowing an increasing amount of air to seep into the bottle. So the wine is aging and it is a great point of pride. So thank you, Cyril, that our bubbles age magnificently. And um, well, I mean, assuming that they're not, you know, in a, in front of the window on top of a refrigerator and you know all of you know those those hazards um but it's a um um it develops weight it develops a nuttiness it de develops just different characteristics but it does it doesn't go it doesn't taste old and i think that's what uh what the pleasure of it is so joy um <laughs> Yes. When you came from Southern California, because your parents came first yeah. and they were spending their time here first. And um, when, when it was basically structured that, that you would play a bigger role in your family's business and you started getting out on the road and you were doing you know, events all over the place. I remember at one particular event when you told a story about you thought your dad had kind of shortchanged you a little bit from the standpoint of um, not letting you know that you would have some other challenges moving forward. And this wasn't just going to be the cakewalk of having a finished vineyard that was going to grow on forever. So you want to talk a little bit about that story because I thought it was such a delightful story, but it's so true. Um, and if people don't know that, uh, they could come in and think that it's like making widgets, which it's not. Um, so, um, do you remember the story that I'm talking about? 
I do, it was one of the most poignant experiences. Our, the original vineyards of Ironhorse, the, the original 110 acres were planted in 1970, 71 in there. And they, they were planted by Rodney Strong who in um, 74 didn't uh, exercise his lease option on the property. It reverted back to a consortium of doctors and dentists who owned it. And my parents were the white knights in 1976 who came in and, and rescued the vineyard from sure and certain development. And um, so I joined the winery in 1985. And uh, I really did feel that it was very much like Thanksgiving dinner when you waltz into the kitchen when the last dish is being dried and offer to help. And that was, <laughs> that was how I viewed my role. <laughs> it was like, here I am. And, um, and then um, some years later, um, in the early part of this century, uh, it came time to uh, replant the vineyards. And I was like, I beg your pardon? What are you talking about? I don't remember seeing that in the fine print. You have to replant them? This is, that's ridiculous. You know, this is, this is a plant that takes seven years. It's not quite like walnuts, but it takes seven years for the vines to mature to give you um, the crop level and the and the most importantly the the flavor profile that you're looking for in the wine. So it never occurred to me. On the other hand, we we probably started replanting a little bit earlier than you might need to. And there are of course um, vines that are um, hundred years old, particularly. And we're going to be tasting uh, your gorgeous uh, Zinfandel. Zinfandel vines are very famous, but they're big producers. So even if the production level is cut in half, you can manage. Um, with Pinot Noir, as we grow here, if you're struggling to get uh, two and a half tons to the acre, and suddenly the production level drops to about a, a ton an acre, um, it the math just does not work. and um, while we think of this as a pure art form, it really cannot be. It needs to also um, pencil out in the end. Um, but one of the great things about it is number one, my brother uh, joined the winery in 1990 and he took over the um, management of the vineyard and he took on this um, breathtaking task of replanting the original 110 acres. And it took him, um, almost 10 years to do it. We didn't just take it all out because obviously you take out the vineyard, then you're taking it out of production. So we did it piece by piece by piece. And as you can imagine, the viticultural practices we use today compared to when the vineyard was originally planted in 1972 um, is just light years apart. So already that just took the quality of our wines up several notches just just there in, in, uh, in the spacing of the rows, the trellising of the vines, the clonal selection. Um, I mean, it was just an amazing, amazing revelation. But in the, in the beginning, Cyril, you're absolutely right. My first uh, response was, what? <laughs> I don't remember you mentioning that. Joy, so in, in our case, we have a program that we literally replant because we we saw that same situation happening. And I believe it was unfair to the second generation to be tasked with this, but it's the reality of it. So we replant about five to seven acres of vineyard every single year. So we never get caught downwind of it too far so that we, we can kind of keep on moving uh, and make sure that we have good vineyard. And there's no question, every block of vineyard that's planted now is substantially better than that block of vineyard that was there before based upon what we can do and the expertise as you said and what farming techniques that are happening and the science and just knowing a lot more we talk about the soil and the conditions of the of the land but in your case you've got a few different processes that you have to go through when you're making sparkling wine and you're making bubbles and you want to have those bubbles be in there so that those little bubbles are moving up through 
the glass uh, forever and you have you have that effervescence that, that happens from that. Can you talk a little bit about disgorging? We have questions from people saying, how does disgorging add to, and what does it do to, to making uh, a sparkling wine uh, or champagne? And you may, I believe you do all of yours in Method Champagne Laws, uh, which you might explain what the difference of those two are also for, for some people out there. We've beat the heck out of them about growing Cabernet and all the rest, but this is a whole different thing. And, if, and it's really your stage to, to say anything you wanna say. Well, thank you, because I love to talk about bubbles, and I have a self-awarded uh, PhD in bubbles, so I am happy to answer any and all questions. And Don, you mentioned in your in the chat, you mentioned speak to late disgorge. So first, let's talk about what is disgorge. It is the ugliest word in the English language, and it's one of the few that literally gets no better in French, degorgement, but it means expelling the yeast cells. So quickly, quickly, we handpick the grapes. We uh, pick earlier for sparkling wine than we do for still wine, which is why the cool climate is so important. So it extends the growing season. So we have a lower sugar level, but no lack of flavor. Um, if you're in a warm area and you're trying to pick at a lower sugar level, it just means the grapes are immature. So you have to be in a special place. And just like champagne is a special region of France for bubbles, so too in California, we have select locations that are cooler uh, in general, like the Carneros area or up the coast, Anderson Valley, Green Valley, of course, is the very best. And um, um, that's the, those are the prime areas for um, growing grapes for sparkling wine. So we hand harvest, we make this a uh, very delicate juice. We press more gently for sparkling than we do. So the yield is smaller out of the press. We make the, the base wine. In fact, what we're doing right now is uh, the blending trials for the 2020 vintage of sparkling wines. Um, once we decide on those, and that's like blending all wines, it's like mixing paint. If you just put all your favorite lots of wine together, it doesn't necessarily make the best wine. You wanna tell a story. It has to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, and we do not uh, resort to uh, recipe winemaking. We feel very strongly that every vintage is distinctive. We're trying to tell the story of that year and uh, most importantly, we treat winemaking like baseball. We're only as good as our last finish. So we're always trying to take it up a notch. Um, you take that wine, you put it in the bottle, the same bottle that you have in front of you, I hope right now. And that uh, we add, we put in the wine and we add a precise amount of sugar and yeast. The sugar triggers a secondary fermentation the natural byproduct of fermentation is the creation of CO2, which would normally escape from the barrel or the tank, but we trap it underneath a crown cap, basically a Coca-Cola bottle cap, that forces the gas to dissolve into the wine. Ta-da! Bubbles. It is the littlest trick of nature, which is why, and I, before you go off and spread this, I'm all alone on this, so you may be wary of following my lead, but I do not believe the world had to wait for Dom Perignon to invent champagne. I think Cleopatra invented champagne. So anybody who wants to talk to me about that, I'm happy to talk about that off channel. And um, so where the magic comes in is now you have a wine with bubbles in it, the yeast cells are feeding on the nutrients in the wine. It's just like the lees in a barrel of Chardonnay. They are giving back to the wine a richness and a creaminess, um, which is a chemical process called autolysis. And the longer you age the wine on the yeast in the bottle, the smaller the bubbles. So non-vintage champagne in France by law, we don't have these laws, but these are the standards. Non-vintage must be aged 18 months. Vintage must be aged three years minimum. Tete de cuvee, there is no law, but it's six to eight years. And when I say that the bubbles are becoming smaller, 
what's happening is as the yeast cells break down, they're emitting amino or fatty acids that coat the bubble. So when they go down to the bottom of your glass and rise back up, they don't glom together. And from a perception standpoint, number one, they don't attack you. So the wine is more elegant. Number two is you're gonna get a richer, fuller mouthfeel. For my money, when you're drinking top of the line bubbles, you should not even have to swallow. It should just effervesce away in your mouth. And I do have this fantasy of explaining that to the highway patrolman. <laughs> Officer, I swear I did not swallow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to go there, but I think that's a great <laughs> idea. Um, yes, I, I hope you get off, and uh, and I hope that I hope that works well for you. Um, I don't know how highly we can recommend that, but I think it's it's great. So I think that's a great description in it. And then you have to use a very much larger cork than the, than we use, and so this cork, um, you can see that that I don't know if you can see it, but um, there we go there. Um, and this cork is uh, ballooned back out, but, but um, there's a lot of pressure on putting that cork in the bottle, which keeps that, that CO2 in there also. And by the way, the, it stays there very well, you know, 17, 18 years later. Um, and the, 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 uh, the wine that we had from, for our wedding, you sent over, we brought several, several bottles back. It's been remarkable. And um, it just really... Uh, incredible. And so <clears throat> one of the wines that we kind of fell in love with, and I believe it was at an event that you were involved with at the Sardine Factory, the first time that I tried uh, this, and it was a long, long time ago, but I remember uh, Iron Horse was one of the sponsors. They were involved with this, with a dinner, and um, uh, Ted Ballesteri and um, um, Bert Curtino, Bert Curtino uh, uh, with, at the time, Fred Dame was actually with them too, and um, they were doing a special dinner, and they and I walked away from this going, "Oh, that is incredible!" And I remember calling you afterwards and said, "Is there any chance that any of this is available?" And uh, and that's kind of started our love affair with the Iron Horse Russian cuvee. And there's a remarkable story to it that really speaks to um, some of the grandeur and. Uh, and, and how, and some of your brilliance of, of marketing. And one of the things that I would like to say right now is that I am so thrilled whenever I get to do an event or a dinner or see joy at a tasting, because I know the rest of the evening is all good. We can go out afterwards and go see each other and, and talk and, and we've had this friendship and we meet all over the world, but joy, joy really does be involved all over the world. And can you talk about some of the history of the Russian cuvee and, and your marketing brilliance that pulled that all together? Well, th thank you. This was, uh, um, it is uh, one of the pillars of our prestige is that we are, I'm optimistically going to say that we are uh, about to embark on the eighth consecutive presidential administration to serve Iron Horse at the White House. And it started with the Reagan Gorbachev summit meetings in 1985, uh, November, 1985. And um, they uh, toasted in Geneva was the first time. And then again in Washington DC with Iron Horse. And we ended up calling, making, continuing to make that wine and calling it Russian cuvee for the three levels of meaning. Number one, the uh, summit meeting, number one. Number two, that we pertain to Russian River Valley and our little town is Sebastopol. And number three is that the um, Russian taste in the 19th century, the gurus, was always for a sweeter style of sparkling wine. Now, the White House serves bubbles at the end of the meal as the toasting wine. So it's with dessert. And so it needs to be a little richer. Um, so that's the story behind Russian cuvee. And then every president since has served Russian cuvee at state dinners. So um, for the Pope, for the president of 
France, for the president of China, for the Queen of England. I mean, it's just been, it's just been so uh, remarkable and so exciting. And um, it is um, strangely, although it is the richest of our sparkling wines, in other words, it has the highest level of residual sugar, the, the, the most amount of dosage, which is the finishing element, um, but it is still technically a brute. Um, um, and then I'll tell you one other really kind of silly, funny other part of the story is that the White House actually ended up not ever serving Russian cuvee. They wouldn't serve Russian cuvee. So we relabeled it for them, Russian River cuvee. <laughs> Very good. And what's so funny is that um, I sent our friends at the White House a, uh, the copy of our label order for, for this, uh, this coming year, calendar year, um, that showed 50 cases worth of, of Russian River Cuvee in the high hopes that they will be ordering <laughs> so that we can move on to our eighth consecutive presidential administration. But I just want you to know, I just want to, you know, that these two wines really are a wonderful bracket of how uh, seriously we take our civic duties at Iron Horse. You know, first with the Ocean Reserve, we, we save the planet with you one delicious sip at a time. And then the Russian cuvee, of course, um, brought you world peace. So you're welcome. We are very happy to <laughs> do our share. <laughs> so a very, very dear friend of ours retired recently, Daniel Shanks, who was, pivotal in helping all of us to have some opportunities in the White House. And I think that you built an incredible relationship with Daniel in doing that and, and great, great hats off to you, Joy. So I've got another question. Have you ever named any other special wine after events like the Gorb Gorbachev's uh, Reagan Summit? Have you done any other wines that you put these names to? Because, um, you know, I'm trying to learn from you every day. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to see where your creativity has taken you. Well, um, first of all, we now make 19 different cuvées. Now, oh. yeah. And I could wake up tomorrow morning and say, you know, I have another idea. Um, because when in doubt, make a new cuvée. And um, so a cuvée is a wonderful word because it can mean just anything that you want it to mean. Uh, but it is usually, um, but not exclusively to sparkling wines, but usually it is. But um, um, there are Chardonnays, um, Cuvée de Ciel. Um, I mean, so Chardonnay, but it means either a special blend or a special lot of wine. But I think generally it means special. Um, and um, beyond that, it doesn't. Oh, and technically it's the first free run juice that comes out of the press. So that is what a cuvee is. But a cuvee can be anything that you want. So we, uh, this year, um, in fact, December 1st, released a wine called um, Resilience. And uh, Resilience uh, benefits the uh, Sonoma County Disaster Relief Fund. And it's called the Resilience Fund. And we were talking in our Friday managers meeting some months ago about the, the operative word for vintage 2020 or just the calendar year of 2020 for all of us is resilience. That's, that's what this year is all about. I mean, resilience is about bounce back. It's about um, being like that perpetual, persistent rise of bubbles in your glass, always rising to the top. Um, so we just released that. Um, in 2017, we started making a wine called Gratitude, and um, that benefits the Redwood Empire Food Bank, uh, which helps feed um, people in need all the way up to the Oregon coast. And uh, we started that after the 2017 um, fires. And what I love about all these um, these small production cuvées like the ocean and the uh, resilience and the gratitude is that they don't, they, they're not a big upfront thing, but over the years it adds up. And um, so it's just an ongoing 
contribution uh, to our community. And so I feel um, incredibly proud of that. Now, I do want to tell Joy out there that we have a wine, you and I have a wine called Joy, and that doesn't benefit anyone but us. So, <laughs> and it only comes in a magnum, of course, and, uh, and that is uh, distinguished by being aged the longest of all of our sparkling wines. And the current vintage is a 2005. And as I say, it only, it only comes, um, it only comes in magnums. And um, so, um, yeah, but I'm, it's very likely that I could end up making a Cyril cuvee. Oh my goodness. <laughs> no, I don't think it would have the cachet. Uh, Joy, with all the philanthropic things that you and your family have done to support so many charities all over the world, not just locally, but certainly locally also, you also personally dedicate a lot of your time to the State Food and Agricultural Board. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you know, not a lot of people are um, asked to, to really step up and do these things and, um, and, and, and you do. And so that's personal and this is meant to be personal. I'm, I'm not a news commentator trying to get things from you, but I just, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your service on the State Food and Agriculture Board. Well, th first of all, thank you very much. I mean, it's first of all, it's an incredible honor. I'm appointed by the governor. I was appointed by Jerry Brown and then appointed to my second term by Gavin Newsom. And um, first and foremost, Cyril, we're farmers. That's who we are. And, um, and so um, I think that that is, uh, everything we confront as farmers is so critical, water uh, being a number one, um, to be sure, and, um, but also healthy soils and the food and ag uh, department has a fantastic uh, program on incentivizing farmers to do more, to keep our soils healthy. Um, you may not know this yet, but you will, that next Earth Day, is the theme is regenerative agriculture. And regenerative agriculture are things that, Cyril, you and I and all of us do very naturally, like cover crops. And you know, just, we take that as part of fine wine grape growing. Uh, but it, what it does amazingly is um, help sequester carbon into the soil. And so it really is extremely important to get more and more and more farmers on board with climate smart agriculture. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, that I'm very passionate about. Here on the property, we're restoring a salmon habitat. For some uh, wonderful reason, Green Valley Creek is a prime spawning spot right at the bridge to the winery. It's the most romantic place for coho salmon and they just love to spawn here. And so we're going to help them um, by widening uh, out some of the channel, working with um, fish and wildlife. And that's a multi-year, big, 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 um, big, big, big project. So uh, very, very excited about that. The um, um, other thing that I uh, am very, uh, passionate about is broadband. And this, you really don't wanna get me started, but I feel so strongly about expanding broadband, particularly in our rural areas, um, because 40 some odd percent of the rural communities do not have access to high speed broadband. And the pandemic has laid bare what a terrible, terrible disgrace discrepancy in and inequity that that is. Um, just think about uh, trying to have kids go to school or telemedicine or safety. I mean, it's just, and I believe from the bottom of my heart that if we can take care of this one really quite simple, practical piece of infrastructure, that's all it is, and the cheapest form of infrastructure there is, that so much will flow from this one achievement. Now I am 
I'm optimistic that something is finally going to be happening on both the state and the federal level. Um, but you know, how to all come out in the sausage making that is, you know, policy uh, on both levels, I don't know. But um, I am uh, personally dedicated to, to seeing that happen. I really think it's so important that everybody needs to have equal access to high-speed internet. And it's not just about Netflix, it's about being able to work and being able to learn. And um, so I'm very, very um, dedicated to that. So Joy, I, I happen to agree with you fully. Um, for those of us who live in more rural areas, the ability to get broadband is harder than it might be in the cities uh, to, to get it. And what's interesting up here is that there is a uh, rural uh, structure to get fiber optics throughout all of the state up in Idaho, which is where I am right now. And you can be on the smallest little dirt road and see a little, a little post on the side of the road saying, do not dig here because it's got fiber optics in it. And it's going to some little rancher out in the middle of nowhere um, to do that. But it takes that kind of dedication uh, to, to do this. And it's gonna take a lot of work to make it happen. And, and I, my hat's off to you for, for helping to keep pushing this. Um, by the way, your friend Joy out there, uh, wanted me to let you know that when Joy was released, one of those bottles was sabered when she graduated from the CIA. And that bottle is in a place in her living room right now. And she says, thank you very much, Joy, for the joy. So. I, uh, I just read that and responded. And, I, you know, one of the most, I'm sure you feel this way too, Cyril. One of the most wonderful things is when you hear a story like that and you say, oh my gosh, we are lucky enough to be a part of your life, something, a moment that was really worth celebrating. And um, it is the most heartwarming thing to hear and it's the most encouraging and it really wants us to do more and do better. So Joy, I know I love you. Joy, Joys stick together. So we have a couple of people who are saying that they are committed to trying to drink some resilience for the 12, 31, 20, so for New Year's Eve, um, that there's a group of, of our watchers and participants wanting to know how they get that. So at the end of this, we will make sure that everybody who is a participant on our webinar, if you've had to listen to Joy and I myself talk about all of our stories and go back and forth, the least we can do with you is offer uh, some of Joy's uh, products. So anything that that Joy is willing to uh, let you have, we will put a note back to all of you either this evening at the end or tomorrow morning, first thing, but we will get that right to you. And once again, connect you directly with Joy. This is important, by the way. If you wanna buy wines from Chapley, you've gotta buy it from, from us. If you wanna buy wines from Joy, you have to buy it from her. Neither one of us have a license that allows us to sell each other's product. We would love it, it would make it much easier, but that's just how it works. So, we just want to let you know that we're, we are a complete support of each other. Uh, and if you're buying as much wine as you possibly can buy from Joy. Um, and so we are, we are here for you. And, you know, it's been interesting. You know, as we talked about, both of us have made a commitment to our families, to the land, to the properties that our parents created so that the next generations, and you now say that there's four generations from Barry and Audrey, who have, uh, who are the, the your parents? Um, we now have four generations alive from my my parents, um, and my mother is living still on the property also. So there is so many fun similarities that keep running. The one thing that I was talking to a succession specialist today about this, and that we have to be able to create our businesses. And we have to have a clientele who are willing to support our businesses, whether Joy and I are here or not. This is really about multiple generations and is making this all happen. So um, the idea is to have such a good structure, have so many great people. We have winemaking teams that are so dedicated, vineyard teams that are so dedicated. And with the hope that we do have a next generation, one of those next four generations, but if it has to skip a generation, it does. Um, but the idea is we try to give back to the soil, give back to the property, 
all the time. And, it, um, and that's really part of our objective. Um, so I probably should speak just briefly about two of the wines that that we brought um, along with this that were sent to you if anybody uh, did get them. But the, uh, the Zinfandel, which we have now turned over for years, um, my sisters uh, have been involved with doing art pieces on them. And the Zinfandel uh, now has one of Leisure's pieces on it. And, uh, and the Zinfandel is really quite marvelous and really beautiful. And this is another one of those opportunities that came from friends knowing friends. And this was uh, Philip Titus, our winemaker, who basically uh, uh, was great friends and still is with John Thatcher, who owns Bald Mountain. And when uh, John got called by his family to go run one of his family's companies, um, he basically went to Philip and said, what am I gonna do with these beautiful grapes? And Philip said, well, uh, let me talk to Cyril and see what we can do here. And Philip was so convincing that these grapes were spectacular. And Bald Mountain is right across the valley from us up in the mountains above off of, uh, of the road that goes over to, just directly to the town of Sonoma, uh, where the Trinity Road goes over there. And um, beautiful piece of property. And they had some of that 100-year-old Zinfandel that Joy talked about a little bit little bit ago. And, um, and so we started making a wine out of that. And we've never looked back. It's been so nice, very small production. We'll never make a lot of it. But it's, it was really fun. And we decided we would present that this evening for, for you to enjoy tonight also. And um, it's and, delicious. Well, thank you. Delicious. It's got a great nose to it, too. So um, now, come on, aren't you impressed that I even have a glass this shape? <laughs> well, so Joy, let's talk about glasses for just a moment. We're using a standard uh, Bordeaux glass right here. And I know that the flute was the glass that was chosen for so many years to be the glass that sparkling or champagne, but I understand that you're willing to put it in a much bigger glass from time to time when you want to get all the flavor of it. What would be your choice if you wanted to get the maximum amount of flavor out of one of your sparkling wines? Well, first of all, the bigger glass has one major obvious advantage. It holds more wine. So that is always <laughs> just as a starting point. Um, but I, and, I, and I, I'm not supposed to say this, so please don't tell my mother, but um, I am not that fussy about glassware. Um, just like I am not that fussy about um, my, um, stereo equipment. Um, I, I just enjoy the music and um, I, I can discern the difference, but if it's not a, a, a um, winery tasting and it's, we're just having fun, then you know what? I'm really okay. And, um, and a gorgeous wine is going to overcome all. I mean, some things are, are, are a problem. Oh, okay, look at Joy. this happy couple. I want to show you what we toasted with. And these glasses have a wonderful story. You and I have both spent time with George Riedel and Ava. And on our way to our wedding, uh, we, Blakesley and I stopped at the in Kustan, Kustan, Austria, at their uh, facility where they're making their glasses. And Ava gave these glasses. These glasses were made for ships that were going to be uh, just uh, made and for their first void, maiden voyage. And, um, and so they were for christening the ships. Each one of these glasses, Joy, you will love this, will fit one entire bottle of your champagne. And we tested it and it works. Um, I'm not sure what happens when you drink that whole bottle uh, in one sitting, but that's when you talked about having a bigger bigger bottle, that's our bigger glass. Uh, I think that really is speaking to it. So I thought I had that picture there, we should pull it up. But um, this is the shape of glass that we, we just did our dosage trials on, uh, gosh, Monday. Um, morning and 
this is the shape of glass we use at the winery. So this, if I were to tell you what is the optimum, it's not as narrow a flute, but here's what happens. The more narrow the flute, the better the retention of the bubbles. The bigger the glass, the more you're gonna get the bouquet, which is what you were referring to, Cyril. But now when you use something really big, like a coupe, the bubbles are going to dissipate. When the, when the bubbles get knocked down, it changes the acid balance of the wine. So it's not just the retention of the bubbles, but the acid balance is going to change. And so it, the wine will seem sweeter. Um, one of the things uh, in a tasting with um, George Riedel, he happens to like to decant his champagne, which is like, are you kidding me? We spent all that time getting the bubbles in, getting them smaller, and now you decant it just to get rid of them, but he, that's his taste, and that's what makes the world go around. Um, but you get much more of a wine-like character, obviously, and the bubbles get knocked down, and it's going to, the wine is going to taste older, more mature. Um, so we had the fun of tasting actually the Ocean Reserve together in both a big glass and a small glass, and it was like they were two different vintages. So the, the glass does change the flavor. There is no doubt about it. Um, but this to me is the ideal, although, you know, when you're having fun, the bigger glass wins. So um, David out there says, uh, big glass is terrific because you have to drink faster or appreciate the change in the character. I, I'm completely in agreement uh, with you. By the way, Joy, Mom is watching now, so we have to now be a little more careful about what we say. So um, she 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 is there watching us too. And mom, it's great to have you here with Thank everybody. You, Molly. Thank uh, you, Molly. Thank you. So um, so the other wine that we brought was a wine that's near and dear to my heart, which is our Cabernet Franc. And I did bring that. And Cabernet Franc to me has this velvetiness at the end in the finish that I think is really delightful. And it's one of those wines that we can't make a lot of and we don't really try to make a lot of it. We originally planted that vineyard to be a blender and to blend. And, and within that, we saw that the, that the flavors were really quite remarkable. And something that Joyce said a little while ago that fits with Chapelet too, and there's so many similarities as we move through this wine site, there's no formula for these wines. If Philip and the winemaking team decided that they liked the Cabernet Franc a little better with some Petit Verdot in it, or a little bit of Cabernet, or maybe even some Merlot, that is certainly their right or their option. What they're trying to do is be true to the flavor and structure of the grape. They really want to be true to making a really beautiful Cabernet Franc. So the only critical thing that they have to do by law is make sure that 75% of this wine is Cabernet Franc if we're gonna label it as Cabernet Franc. Typically it's 85 to 90% Cabernet Franc, but it can be blended and there is no formula. There is no recipe for it. What it is, is brilliantly smart palates working together to create a wine that has similarity and it shows the structure of the earth and the terroir and what we consider uh, what makes Pritchard Hill unique. And most of you understand that the flavors from Pritchard Hill do have a unique structure uh, there. So, um, so I hope you enjoy that too. It's one of the wines that uh, I enjoy taking to friends' houses for dinner. Um, and uh, I find works really well with all types of, of things uh, and uh, can be paired with anything. I think tonight, uh, Blake's is making a Chateaubriand filet or something uh, with it. And, and I'm just kind of joking because we haven't even thought about dinner at 6, 6.24 our time here and um, we've got a ways to go, but, um, but it's always good to be able to dream about your next meal because um, you're not gonna be getting it anyway. So that's what, what I just heard. So <laughs> I, I might as well dream about it. Maybe Christmas Eve. Maybe well, you Christmas know what's Eve. funny, Cyril, is that here's another area where our families are so similar. At breakfast, we're talking about lunch. At lunch, we're talking about dinner. And at dinner, we're talking about breakfast. I mean, we just are, you know, meals. And um, 
that's what we all get together for meals. That's when we drink wine is at meals. I mean, it's a, it's, it's just a, such a critical, exciting, wonderful, wonderful part of the day. Well, both of our families are gourmands at the highest level. And I think the, uh, we were certainly raised by, by dad who uh, he knew every great roadside stop from Los Angeles to San Francisco and any other place that he ever drove. And he would, you would, if you were driving from one place to another, he would tell you, by the way, you need to stop at Bob's in this town. You need to stop at, at Jake's in this town. You need to stop. And, and there was something remarkable on every menu that he would tell you what it was and how to have that. And I, and I miss that from dad because uh, it's, it's hard to, for him to tell me what those things are anymore. So now I've got to use my own memory, but um, it, it was part of us. And, you know, mom has dedicated a lot of her life to spending time with the chefs uh, and, and working with them. And Joy, that speaks to you also. You know, one of the magical things that I think both of our parents saw in the two of us was that we live this on a daily basis and we get to, to have these friendships and your Rolodex I guarantee it has three to 500 of the most remarkable chefs in the world in your Rolodex that you can call them as your friend. And you could call them at the last minute at any time and somehow get that corner table or get a spot to be able to eat. And also that you support them and you help them. And I think that that's a magical thing that the two of us have in common and that, 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 that we love. And, um, and we support the restaurants who support us and vice versa. So it's, it's really an ongoing. Uh, and, you know, Joy, I think of all the different chefs that I've seen you within over the years. Um, the part that I'd like you to just address, it's been a very sad year for the two of us because we have not been able to enjoy many of them in person. How have you been dealing with this and staying in, to stay in touch? And one of those people is, uh, Daniel Bruce, uh, that I think of when I think of you, I think of, here's a guy who just loves you so much. And, um, and he's been really good about reaching out to all of us. But um, talk about how you've been able to stay in touch with some of those people. Well, first of all, you're, it, it is so incredibly sad. And we want to do everything that we can to um, support our restaurant friends. I mean, uh, I don't think the restaurant is going to go away. I mean, the tavern managed to survive the plague. So I think that we'll, we'll overcome this, but I do urge everybody to uh, take advantage of the um, wonderful um, pickup service that you can get from your restaurants and, uh, and support them that way. It's really right now, at least here in California where we're completely uh, stay at home. Uh, it's really the, the, the best way uh, that we can help support them. And, um, and I think caring, I think caring is really important and making sure that when we do have the opportunity to get back out there, um, that we do. I know I certainly will be ready to party. And I hope, <laughs> I hope you'll all join me in, uh, in doing that. Well, I think, and along with that is it's really important for all of us who have the ability and are ordering out and seeing uh, and able to get uh, delivery food, uh, put that 20% on there, give them the tip, try to, you know, I know it's not the same service as if, if you were in the restaurant for three or four hours, but their staffs need it just as much as ever, if not more than ever. And so do what you can do to support your local restaurants, call them, give them, you know, maybe they'll make you a big bucket of soup. Who knows what it is? I'll bet they would do more than you think if you were offering it to them and you're trying to make that work. And so, so one of the things that Joy and I have done, and we try to do, we, we used a promotional code that hopefully all you can remember, which is friends. And so if you can remember friends, you'll receive a 50% off on all of our wines from Chapel and Iron Horse. And uh, if there's any of the wines you've tasted tonight or any of the wines that have piqued your interest, some of the wines that Joy talked about, 19 different wines. That's a lot of wines that she's making. And they're all spectacular. 
she does make some still wines also. So, uh, and we don't compete basically, you know, I, if I see a bottle of her wine in, in a restaurant, I buy it. It's not comp competition. This is marvelous. Um, the one challenge is that with all the COVID stuff, people are shipping more than ever been shipped before. Blakesley had to wait for about an hour and a half today in the UPS line just to be able to get some items that were on hold at UPS for us. Uh, and um, so that's happening. So you'll have to, my recommendation is, is order early if you want it for the holidays. But another thing that Joy, I want you to talk to just for a moment. I think of sparkling wines typically as celebratory and, and for the holidays, but they really are not. They're so perfect with so many other things. Can, so can you talk about how you would use sparkling wines throughout the normal course and that, um, that there's always another occasion that, I mean, you just, you say it so well, we were talking about it a few days ago. So can you really expound on it's not just waiting for the right occasion? Uh, no, quite the contrary. You can make it the right occasion just by popping a bottle of bubbles. Um, people talk a lot about comfort food. I think there is such a thing also as comfort wine. And I think bubbles fall in that category. And the reason why I say that is that they make you smile. There's just no way around it. And if you, um, in my personal opinion, you should have two bottles of bubbly chilling in your refrigerator at all times. If for nothing else to give the appearance of being optimistic, you don't know something good might happen and you just might wanna celebrate. But beyond that, every time you open the fridge and you see a bottle of bubbles, I promise you, you are going to smile. And uh, particularly now that I have made that mental association for you, the power of suggestion is all powerful, but it is, celebratory is another word for fun. And uh, fun is a very important thing for us to grab whenever we can, because we all know that just the act of smiling uh, and you could, even if you don't feel like smiling, if you smile, the exercising those muscles is going to make you feel better. And when you do that, then everyone around you feels better. And um, so basically what I'm trying to say is that the, what the world needs now is a glass of iron horse. And that is, <laughs> that's my motto. <laughs> Okay, along with that iron horse, we're getting some questions from people out there saying, Joy, what food would you recommend with your bubbles? Um, and is there anything in particular? I know that one of the things that my mother would like to have, and by the way, uh, mom, we are arranging it for you, is some Black River caviar <gasps> to go yes. along with it. And yes. so- is there something else besides caviar that you might recommend oh, to our chips. viewers? Potato chips, potato uh, chips, popcorn, popcorn, movie night, bubbles, popcorn, movie, unbelievable. Anything salty, Perfect. anything salty, anything fried, fried chicken, unbelievable. Um, sushi. So remember when I was talking about how the bubbles get smaller is because of the release of the amino acids from the core of the molecules of the spent yeast cells. Well, that's what umami is. Umami is amino acids. So when you're releasing that in the wine, so uh, anything that's rich in umami, so sushi, uh, avocado, oh my God, unbelievable. Very soon here for fellow Northern Californians, we're gonna have Dungeness crab. That ocean reserve and Dungeness crab is just gonna be Fantastic. Um, anything um, with bread, remember this is sitting on yeast cells. So bready, doughy, toasty, that's always good. Um, spicy food. Um, and the other thing that's great is um, like with Asian cuisine, when you have a lot of different flavors going on, a lot of different dishes, bubbles have a great way of both bringing flavors together as well as keeping them separate so you can you can switch around and um so there's a versatility uh to bubbles and i'll tell you what um this might seem counterintuitive but steak steak and in that case i like to serve the bubbles in a giant burgundy glass i get a bath of bubbles down my throat 
And I just feel like I am James Bond. And that is a feeling I strive for every day. So Joy, it sounds to me like bubbles will go with just about anything. And I think Peter says, I just saw a note from him. He says, bubbles do go with everything. And June says, uh, by the way, a terrific grilled cheese sandwich works well too. And that speaks to the fattiness, speaks to the cheese, speaks to the saltiness, speaks yeah. to all those food groups that, that are toast. And, the, and the bread. Absolutely. So you've got and, it all uh, there. So Matthew is asking about bubbles. Oh, I'm totally in favor. Totally in favor. I think uh, berries are delicious. I think um, um, mango is delicious. Sliced mango is really great. Obviously, peaches, when they're in season, are fantastic. Um, the only thing, and uh, mimosa, I think an orange juice is just fabulous. The only thing I would say is do me a giant favor. Make it fresh squeezed, make it in season, make it delicious so that it's on the caliber of the wine. That's my only, that's my only request. Joy, as a wonderful way to end this, our relationship is absolutely delicious and is something that will, will as the test of time has already stood for. But uh, moving forward, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your evening to come and enjoy some time with all of our clients. And I'm delighted to see some of your clients. And I hope that, that, uh, that we have done honor to them all. Uh, and we are so lucky to have a group of probably three to 400 people who are actually watching us now who have continued on. Uh, and so all those people who are out there, a very, very Merry Christmas, a happy Hanukkah, happy New Year, and, and, and a wonderful holiday to all of you. And a big toast from Joy and myself to you and uh, my love, love to you and Blakesley. Um, you've got to come over here, at least wave to everybody and say hi, because she's yeah. been working the whole time to Thank make all this. Joy. All happy, uh, happy holidays. And you, know, you, 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 are the secret weapon. you are the secret weapon in this Blake's way. Thank you. <laughs> You're so cute. Well, we're very fortunate and, um, we might stay up here a little bit longer since California, there's not much happening down there. And, uh, so if anybody uh, is interested, remember friends, because that's Joy and I, and uh, we'll send you some offers uh, for it if you're interested. And this is not meant to be a sales pitch, but I know there was a lot of questions coming in about how they get the wines, um, and we're happy to help you in any way we can. Um, our, our dogs uh, have now finally gotten up. They've been laying down beside us the whole time, and uh, they're trying to tell us, uh, Patricia and Wayne, that it's time to go feed them. Uh, and we know that your boxers are probably telling the same thing. So, uh, so have a wonderful evening. Have a have a drive Thank safe. Thank you. Thank you. Be Thank safe. you, everybody. This has been just tremendous. So much fun for me. I appreciate being included. Thank you. Anytime that you want to get in any one of these things, it's on Thursday evenings, and we would love to have you as a guest or just kind of pop on just to say <laughs> hello too. So. Thank you so much, Joy. It was great to see you, and you're so sweet to do this. Love you. Bye-bye. You've got to pull the other one down so you can get to the corner, and you're going to get the end. Pull the other one down. Down. You've got to get to the end here.